Slum Lake. That was a piece of your mind. Um, a few months after I moved to Kalamazoo, this is 1980, uh, my dad was just trying to check out where his little girl, baby girl, was living. And he came out, and I saw that Val picked this picture, so I just wanted to give some context. That was when dad came, this is when Kalamazoo Airport had two, what, just um, propeller flights, Republic Airline, and he came, and he went to Olin Mills, if you remember, and that's one of the pictures that we took in 1980. Um, um, this is, I'm told, the celebration of life, but I'm very sad. And I've had time to think why it's so painful. Um, my end is inevitable for all of us. And let's face it, at 95, Dad beat the odds. Sometimes Dad since, um, was Dad. Sometimes he was my mom. Sometimes he was my friend, my counselor, my um, advisor, and even many times my adversary. Okay, but Dad needs provided consistency. I've had time to think about this. The why when someone's 95 and they go on, why you feel an emptiness? Because he was just always there. Through tragedy, through challenges, <coughs> good times, he was just always there even when I was separated by him by thousands of miles, because whenever you know I live quite well. And I was blessed to be able to spend, I never thought I'd be able to spend the last six weeks here uh, with him. Um, so I'm just gonna share a few memories that some of you don't know you know, from the other part of his life growing up with him. Um, you know, you know, you've heard that he's very active. So, um, there was advantages to having an outgoing dad. Okay, my 11th birthday party was an ice skating pizza party. Okay, so picture dad taking a bunch of 11 year old girls who had variable skills ice skating. Most were hanging on him as he effortlessly skated around the room. <laughs> right? The little girls are hanging on, and then we went down and had the pizza. Okay. Um, Slay Wyatt. My brother and I grew up in Dykeman Projects in Upper Manhattan, and we had Hill. Dad would take us sleigh riding. It was, um, we piled high, the oldest on the bottom. The youngest and smallest on top, so a lot of times Dad was on the bottom and I'm holding on to the top as we went down the hill. But as many of you have heard here, Dad was a competitor. Imagine he enregistered us for a father-child bowling league. Okay, and I was like 18, and it was in the morning on a weekend. Okay. Can you imagine the, the um, car ride home as Dad told me each week that he didn't know how someone could bowl each week and get worse each week? <laughs> <laughs> the car ride home was very painful. But he should have known that a weekend early morning bowling league with a teen girl was a disaster. <laughs> but he was trying to have that bond because he was always busy working. But decades later, uh, he joined my co-workers, some of them are here, thank you, and I on lunch hour bowling excursions. And my co-workers called him the professor. <laughs> and so there was a little redemption, redemption finally from my teeny bopper, uh, his, teeny, uh, his attempt with his teeny bopper of his dad at a time. Uh, dad, the intuition, he tried to make the best of it, um, you know, with the outdoor, and that's what he loved about um, Portage with the tennis and so on. Daddy would try rollerblading, right, in his 70s. Can you imagine? But everything was always fine, but then I would say, but Dad, I smell a lot of Ben Gay in the house. <laughs> so that's how I knew maybe it didn't go so well, because the house reeked of Ben Gay. You know, I remember he had a wipeout one time, you know. <laughs> But you know, it was hard for him to admit it. It was just a bad day that came that remnants. Um, 
as a provider, yeah, and Andrew alluded to this, you know, Dad worked three jobs most of my childhood. But on Sundays was our day. Okay, every Sunday he took me either to the Bronx Zoo, the Guggenheim Museum, or Coney Island. Every single Sunday, right? And at Coney Island, he said he was taking me to ride Psycho. Mm -hmm. And it was a great roller coaster of his time, nothing compared to now. We had that first fall out in the <coughs> um, But really, he really, it, it really wasn't true for the Psycho. I got that one ride, but it was to satisfy his craving for Coney Island war clams. You know, when you put the lemon in it to pass the sauce and you suck them out the shell and you would get a dozen of them and I thought it was pretty gross. No, thank you. Okay. But in the last two years were hard for Dad. You know, giving up his active lifestyle. You know, and as was mentioned, he had no trepidation driving alone to the East Coast. I think I learned the most about Dad when as an adult we drove nonstop from New York to Michigan as he told me one story after another story after another story. I heard a lot. Okay. But forcing Dad to give up his driving license was no easy feat. Some of you know this. Even a week before his passing, he said it was a mistake to give up his license. <laughs> he said, you know, okay. <laughs> he hated that he could not drive to one of my most recent weddings. <coughs> You may, some of you may remember that, you know. And I know Ralph said, I'm not going to be a passenger as he drives, because he didn't want anybody you know, to, to drive in his car. Um, it was at first one of his great nieces. But I just want to let you know, and Val and Denise said this, you know, that he loved you so, so much. You know, many of my, that his family, you know, uh, some drove here from the East Coast and arrived 2 a.m. this morning, you know, to be here with him. Ismail. Ismail sitting here, he has his own challenges. And he told me, I have to be here. Mm -hmm. And he said to Ismail, we flew him to New York. And you loaded up the U-Haul, right? Yeah. And you drove Dad here to Kalamazoo. And that's how he first arrived here. Right, we were pulling the car. And yesterday when I was visiting you, you told me the story about him teaching you tennis. Yeah. He said, yeah. what? He said, go like this, and go like this, right? <laughs> so I mean, we didn't mention the tennis. I forgot about the tennis in the uh, obituary. But he knew that his time was coming there. Aunt B. Aunt B is known him the longest. I've known him 60 years. Aunt B, you've known him since you were a teen, right? And you're 95, I'm not sure. <laughs> Right? And she came here from New York to be here. Right? And from the Bronx. But a few days before the, his departure from this world, he asked me to put your phone number in his cell phone. Did you know that? <laughs> he said, let's beat his number. I think he wanted to call because he knew. He felt the call. He had started becoming aware of his eminent inevitable departure. But Dad was there when I needed him the most, and that was the consistency I was talking about in the beginning. Imagine leaving New York to answer my call to be a trustworthy caregiver for a two-year-old Zabeda. He did that, and gave decades of solid support to me through my changing family dynamics. He provided that consistency. <coughs> consistency. Two days before he left us, Daddy looked up at the clock. And 10 minutes before school is scheduled to be let out, he asked, who's picking up his six-year-old great-granddaughter Camilla from school? <laughs> Two days, he died. Sunday, that was Friday. He was still from his chair managing the family to make sure everyone was where they were supposed to be. Okay. So it pained me this month to see him fight so hard. And he fought really hard. Um, and Dad always says, when people call, I'm hanging on with both hands. <laughs> that was his favorite thing. Other than just telling us, you just march the troops off the cliff. The man always told me, I'm tired of hearing that whenever we were like in disarray. 
you know, you just watch the troops off the cliff. Okay? But the night before he passed, many of us here saw him. As I lay next to him, I whispered, you can rest now, Daddy. We will be all right. And he actually looked up at me and said, okay. And eight hours later, he stopped hanging on with both hands. Rest in peace, Daddy.